Perhaps the most striking example in 20th century America of a fictitious persona being created for a public figure, without any conscious coordination among the intelligentsia, was that of Herbert Hoover. Hoover's misfortune was to be President of the United States when the stock market crash of 1929 was followed by the beginning of the Great Depression of the 1930s. Had he never become President, Herbert Hoover could have gone down in history as one of the greatest humanitarians of the century. It was not simply the amount of money he donated to philanthropic causes before he became President, but the way he risked his own personal fortune to rescue starving people in Europe during the First World War that made him unique. Because the blockades, destruction, and disruptions of the war had left millions of people across Europe suffering from hunger, or even starving, Hoover formed a philanthropic organization to get food to them on a massive scale. However, realizing that if he operated in the usual way, by first raising money from donations and then buying the food, people would be dying while he was raising money. Hoover bought the food first, putting his own personal fortune at risk if he could not raise the money to pay for it all. Eventually, enough donations came in to cover the cost of the food, but there was no guarantee that this would happen when he began. Hoover also served as head of the Food Administration in Woodrow Wilson's administration during the war, where he apparently sufficiently impressed supporters of another member of that administration, a rising young man named Franklin D. Roosevelt, that these FDR supporters sought to interest Hoover in becoming the Democrats' nominee for president in 1920, with FDR as his vice presidential running mate. However, only the latter came to pass, with Roosevelt being the running mate for Democratic presidential candidate James M. Cox, who lost in 1920 while Hoover went on to serve as Secretary of Commerce under Republican Presidents Warren Harding and Calvin Coolidge. So much for the real Herbert Hoover. What whole generations have heard and read about is the fictitious Herbert Hoover, a cold, heartless man who let millions of Americans suffer needlessly during the Great Depression of the 1930s because of his supposedly doctrinaire belief that the government should leave the economy alone. In short, the image of Hoover depicted by the intelligentsia was that of a do-nothing president. According to this view, widely disseminated in both the popular media and in academia, as well as repeated at election time for decades, it was only the replacement of Hoover by FDR that got the federal government involved in trying to counter the effects of the Great Depression. The falsity of this picture was exposed back during the Great Depression itself by leading columnist Walter Lippmann, and that falsity was confirmed in later years by former members of Roosevelt's own administration, who acknowledged that much, if not most, of the New Deal was simply a further extension of initiatives already taken by President Hoover. Lippmann, writing in 1935, said, The policy initiated by President Hoover in the autumn of 1929 was something utterly unprecedented in American history. The national government undertook to make the whole economic order operate prosperously. The Roosevelt measures are a continuous evolution of the Hoover measures. Herbert Hoover was quite aware and proud of the fact that he was the first president of the United States to make getting the country out of a depression a federal responsibility. No president before had ever believed there was a government responsibility in such cases, he said in his memoirs. Nor was such interventionism a new departure for Hoover, who earlier as Secretary of Commerce had urged a reduction in the hours of labor and advocated a constitutional amendment to forbid child labor, among other interventionist initiatives. As president, Hoover responded to a growing federal deficit during the Depression by proposing, and later citing into law, a large increase in tax rates, from the existing rate of between 20 and 30 percent for people in the top income brackets, to new rates of more than 60 percent in those brackets. None of this, of course, means that either Hoover's or FDR's interventions were helpful on net balance. Nor is that the point, which is that a completely fictitious Herbert Hoover was created, not only in politics, but in the writings of the intelligentsia. For example, the fictitious Hoover cared only for the rich, whose taxes the real Hoover more than doubled, taking more than half their income. The fictitious Hoover was unconcerned about ordinary working people, but the real Hoover was praised by the head of the American Federation of Labor for his efforts to keep industry from cutting workers' wages during the Depression. The intelligentsia of the times created the fictitious Hoover, and the intelligentsia of later times perpetuated that image. In 1932, Oswald Garrison Villard, editor of The Nation, said that President Hoover failed for lack of sympathy. A New Republic editorial said of Hoover, he has been the living embodiment of the thesis that it is the function of the government not to govern. Noted literary critic Edmund Wilson said that Hoover made no effort to deal with the breakdown and called him inhuman. Joint columnists Robert S. Allen and Drew Pearson denounced Hoover's do-nothingness. 
As far away as England, Harold Lasky said, Mr. Hoover has done nothing to cope with the problem. In politics as well, the fictitious Hoover had the same image, and that image lived on. In 1936, when Herbert Hoover was no longer a candidate, FDR's Secretary of the Interior, Harold Ickes, nevertheless attacked Hoover for having been a do-nothing president, a trend that continued for many elections in later years, as Democrats repeatedly pictured a vote for Republican presidential candidates as a vote to return to the days of Herbert Hoover. It was twenty years after Hoover left the White House before there was another Republican president. As late as the 1980s, President Ronald Reagan was characterized by the Democrat Speaker of the House, Tip O'Neill, as Hoover with a smile, and when Reagan's Secretary of the Treasury defended the administration's economic policies in a statement to Congress, Democratic Senator Ernest Hollings said, That's Hoover talk, man, even though Reagan's tax cut policy was the direct opposite of Hoover's tax increases. Even in the 21st century, the 2008 financial crisis provoked a New York Times columnist to express fear that the 50 state governors would become 50 Herbert Hoovers. In short, Hoover's image was still politically useful as a boogeyman, decades after his presidency and even after his death. One of the signs of the great sense of decency of Harry Truman was that a month after he became president in 1945, he sent a handwritten letter to Herbert Hoover, inviting him to the White House for the first time since Hoover left it in 1933 to seek his advice on food aid to Europe after the disruptions of the Second World War. Hoover was both surprised by the letter from President Truman and moved to tears when he met with Truman in the White House. Later, Truman's appointment of Hoover to head a commission to investigate the efficiency of government agencies enabled this much-hated man to regain some public respect in his later years and shake off some of the opprobrium that went with the intelligentsia's creation of a fictitious Herbert Hoover. Fictitious positive images can, of course, also be created, not only by propaganda agencies in totalitarian countries, but also by the intelligentsia in democratic countries. No politician in the past two generations was regarded by intellectuals as more of an intellectual than Adlai Stevenson, the suave and debonair former governor of Illinois, who twice ran for president of the United States against Dwight Eisenhower in the 1950s. The New York Times called him the best kind of intellectual. Russell Jacoby's study, The Last Intellectuals, depicted Eisenhower's resounding defeat of Adlai Stevenson as showing the endemic anti-intellectualism of American society. Yet Stevenson could go quite happily for months or years without picking up a book, according to noted historian Michael Beschloss, among others who reported Stevenson's disinterest in books. Meanwhile, no one thought of Harry Truman as an intellectual, though he was a voracious reader, whose fare included heavyweight books like the works of Thucydides and Shakespeare, and who was a president who enjoyed Cicero in the original Latin, someone who was able to correct Chief Justice Fred M. Vinson when Vinson quoted in Latin.